Hi, welcome to RV Refrigerators Misdiagnosed number one. My name is Annalie Ford. I'm a co-owner and instructor at Ford's RV Training and Service. This is an introductory to a series of many videos to follow on RV refrigerators. Roger and I are going to educate you on things that you've never seen before and most of it is going to be money saving tips for you. We're not here to sell you anything. We're not here to talk you into anything or out of anything. What we want to do is share our 35 years of pioneering experience on reconditioning and servicing the RV refrigerator. We're going to share a lot of what we have offered to people who have come for our training since 1990. We've had people from all across the United States and other countries. After you watch this and our other videos, please feel free to leave a comment or a question about your RV refrigerator. You can also go to our website at rvrefrigeration.com, go to the blog and you can leave a comment or a question there. We'll personally direct the answer to you in another video. We'd like for you to subscribe so that as we do the new videos, you'll be notified when they come out. And also, if you like our video, please click like. Before I introduce Roger, I want to share a quote with you from the May 2011 Family Motor Coach Association magazine. Gary Bunzer, who is the most recognized educator in the RV industry since the 1970s, wrote an article, and in the article he recommends our training. But he also said, and I quote, It's a fact that many cooling units are misdiagnosed and simply thrown away. This is a cooling unit off of an RV refrigerator. My husband is now going to uh, start our first video here uh, on the refrigerator and the cooling unit and the theory of operation. Hi, I'm Roger Ford, owner and lead instructor at Ford's RV Training and Service in Benton, Kentucky. We're going to discuss the 8 cubic foot RV refrigerator. All three of these units here are 8 cubic foot. This is a Dometic refrigerator. Uh, the two door refrigerator is the most common refrigerator out there. This refrigeration is absorption refrigeration. The refrigerator in your home is compression refrigeration. They both do the same thing, but they are both very different. This is the freezer section that you're used to seeing. The lower temp part of the evaporator is what cools this freezer compartment. This is the lower temp of the evaporator used to cool the freezer compartment. This evaporator is surrounded in urethane insulating the evaporator. Here is the low temperature part of the evaporator which feeds the freezer compartment. You can see it's doing very well. Here's the holes that actually bolt up to the back side of the freezer compartment. This is the refrigerator compartment. In the refrigerator, you'll notice the fins. This is the high temp section of the evaporator which is used to cool the refrigerator compartment. Again, here is the evaporator surrounded with the urethane for insulating. And here is the high temp part of the evaporator. You'll notice the screw holes here. This is for where the refrigerator fins are attached to the evaporator. This is what you see in the refrigerator compartment. Here is the high temperature part of the evaporator which feeds the refrigerator compartment. Here's where the fans screw on. This is normally what you would be looking at. 
And also you'll notice that this ice line is not down in the refrigerator compartment. That's only because this unit is running in the raw, it's not insulated, and the ambient temperature in our shop right now is about 73 degrees. This is the back of the cooling unit. If you open up the excess panel um, on the side of your RV behind the refrigerator, basically this is what you're always looking at. Every refrigerator, when they're turned off, all the liquid condenses, gets heavy, falls back down to the bottom of the unit. So every refrigerator, the liquid line is somewhere in this area here across this cooling unit. Everything from here down is liquid. Everything from here up is gas. This cooling unit is one that we've reconditioned. This cooling unit houses the chemicals needed to perform the cooling in the refrigerator. It's made out of steel and there's no moving parts at all on this refrigerator cooling unit. Home refrigerators are made with soft metals, copper, brass, and aluminum. They generally do not last long in an RV because of the vibration of moving down the road. Steel will, is very durable and it will last a long time. Now let's talk about the chemicals used in the cooling units. There are four main chemicals used. One is distilled water. I don't have to go into a lot of information on it. Uh, the other, one of the other chemicals is we use 100% anhydrous ammonia in charging these cooling units. Another chemical is a rust inhibitor. Uh, I've been doing this I've been researching and developing things for RV refrigerators for about 35 years. I have actually been cutting into these cooling units for over 30 years. Uh, I've heard all kinds of stories where the units will rust from the inside out. I have literally cut thousands of these units open myself and I have never seen any sign of any rust in any way in any unit. This is not true. The rust inhibitor is a good product and it works. Another chemical is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the gas portion of this charge. It's what causes a low atmospheric pressure in the unit allowing ammonia to change state which causes the cooling. We have to create a formula for each refrigerator. It's not like a domestic refrigerator in your home where the same chemical goes into every one. The same formula. Here, it's the same chemicals. But we have to create a formula depending on the make and model for that refrigerator. One thing you need to keep in mind is all of these RV refrigerators, doesn't matter what kind it is or what size it is, they're basically all going to work the same. So, when you have a unit turned off, the liquid line is right in this area, everything from here down is liquid, everything above is gas. When you apply a heat source to the boiler, whether it's gas or electric, it turns that liquid to steam and the steam rises up the boiler to the top of the unit. Now let me show you what this looks like actually in here. Okay, here is the boiler area in the cooling unit. You can see this is the boiler. Here's the 110 volt heat element and it slides into a heat element sleeve that's actually welded to the boiler. You can see, notice this yellow here. Some of you recognize that. 
this unit has a leak. We're going to fix that. And we'll tell you all about the leakers in another video. The heat element should be loose. It should not be sloppy in the heat element sleeve. And the heat element is easy to change. It just slides out and back in. It's a good habit once in a while just to go out and move the heat element. Just to make sure it doesn't seize up in that heat element sleeve. The liquid, you energize the heat element, it heats up the liquid in the lower part of the cooling unit, turns it to steam, it rises up the boiler. The boiler is wrapped with sheet metal and fiberglass insulation to help insulate the boiler. If that wasn't there, they'd have to have a much larger heat element to create more heat to, to cause the cooling. Right now, this heat element is at about a thousand degrees. When the chemical leaves the boiler, it enters the steam line. The steam line comes over to the condenser. As the steam is passing through the steam line, now this steam is distilled water and ammonia. So right at this present, it's a weak ammonia solution. So that steam, as it's passing through here, you'll notice these dimples. This is creating cooling in its surface, more surface, for the steam to touch. As the steam passes through it and touches the cooling in it, it cools. Water condenses quicker than ammonia. So as the water touches the surface, it condenses, goes back to a liquid, and then it falls back down into the bottom of the unit, leaving a strong ammonia vapor. That should be completely separated at this point, so all the water has been separated, leaving you with a strong ammonia vapor. So the ammonia steam enters the condenser. The condenser cools that steam. It enters here, it goes down through the condenser, loops around, and comes back and exits here. As the liquid exits the condenser, it's heavy, of course, it falls down. As it falls down here, what it's doing is forcing that liquid up this liquid line that's attached to the evaporator. And when it reaches the evaporator here, this is where the liquid ammonia reaches the hydrogen, allowing the liquid to change state from liquid to vapor, and the cooling process starts here. The ammonia vapor now passes, slowly passes through the evaporator, low temp evaporator down to the high temp evaporator, and down to the exit of the evaporator line. Now, this is where the evaporator is attached to the freezer compartment, the refrigerator fans, and the heating and cooling transfer takes place. When the chemical exits the evaporator, the hydrogen is saturated with ammonia vapor, making it heavy. So when it reaches this point here, what it does is go down this tube to the absorber vessel where the liquid and gas is separated. The hydrogen leaves the vessel, goes back up to the top of the unit, the liquid portion eventually ends up back in the boiler where it's all recycled and it starts all over again. Thank you for watching GBYY.